We're in a very uh, important prophet area in series called Prophesy. Will you scream at me and say Prophesy? I said scream, say Prophesy. And um, my global call, my international call is prophetic in nature. And what I feel like the Lord is challenging us to do uh, is circumcise our ears once again. If you were here last week, you heard that message uh, because people have been in a type of human isolation that I think uh, Prophet Vicky has moved people to the bankruptcy of the mind, the deficiency of the mind, the limit of the mind. And you know that whenever you are in human isolation, there are things you find out about yourself that are tormenting, degrading. Um, you have all kinds of stuff there. The exploration of the soul, Apostle B, is not fun. Um, people preach it and teach it and imply it, uh, but very few people have the courage to find out what is there. The iniquitous line. The stuff you start to find out that your daddy wanted and his daddy wanted and his granddaddy wanted and all of that stuff that shows up in you. It's not a real fun journey. I'd much rather go to the beach <laughs> or, or the park. But when you start exploring that stuff, there's only one thing, praise the name of the Lord, that is sufficient enough to speak to that stuff. And it is the voice of God. It is the word of the Lord. And so with as much evolution and as with much maturity that this movement goes through, Prophet Jimmy, we ain't going to never not prophesy. I appreciate every light, every camera, every stream, every star, the NFL, the NBA, hockey, uh, UFC, whoever comes amidst us, they're going to receive the prophetic word of God. It is a part of why we started Apostle B. They don't know that. It is a part of what we did. We would stand flat foot and declare the word of the Lord. And so my instructions from God, I can't pay attention to Yarrow to what the Lord told them to do. What the Lord told me to do was to declare his heart to his people and to declare his mind to his people. We're going today to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, a very popular verse. And I'm going to preach as long as I want. If you need to leave, should you need to leave, you can. But I'm going to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. Uh, praise the Lord. He is the most high God. You know, you almost lost me, Elder Ryan, at that song because I love declaring that he is God among the gods. And that anything that tries to compete with or contend with his throne, it's a joke. He is the most high. And because he's the most high, he has, watch me, certain mentalities, Onika, and he has certain prerogatives and agendas that he wants for his people. We're to push that in this season. We're to say that. We're to pray that in this season. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 20 through 25, if you're up there in my beloved media booth, I'd like this in the amplified version, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 20 through 25. I'm going to need a bit of some audience support. And uh, if you are watching me streaming online, I want you to encourage your leaders as they are here getting refreshed because they're getting ready for you. Um, this church is going to more than quadruple when we're back to normal. And what we're doing is we're preparing for that in these moments of refreshing. That is the word of the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20, when you're there, scream and say, I'm there. I'm there. If you're not there, say, wait on me. Okay, Apostle B, give you an announcement. Thank you. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 14. Thank you, Travail. Verse 20. It says this, brothers and sisters, do not be children. It's interesting that he had to give that direction to adults. It's absolutely phenomenal that he had to let adults know don't be children. It means that every now and again, Elder Candace, adults prefer to behave like children. <laughs> they prefer to abase themselves and dispose of responsibility and maturity and intellectualism and philosophy. Don't be children, and the Amplified reads it like this, am immature, childlike, in your thinking. I'd like you to be infants in matters of evil. That means completely innocent and inexperienced. But in your minds, be mature adults, scream yeah. It is written in the law by men of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people and not even then will they listen to me, saith the Lord. Verse 22, therefore unknown tongues are meant for a supernatural sign, not to believers but to unbelievers who might be receptive. While prophecy 
and the, the caption here says, foretelling the future, speaking a new message from God to the people is not for unbelievers, but for believers. So then if the ho whole church gathers together and all of you speak in unknown tongues and outsiders or those who are not gifted in spiritual matters, listen to this, or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Verse 24 says, but if all prophesy, foretelling the future, speaking a new message from God to his people, and an unbeliever or an outsider comes in, he is convicted of his sins by all, and he is called to account by all because he can understand what is being said. Verse 24 is where we get our homiletic principle today. The secrets... The secrets of his heart are laid there. And so falling on his face, he will worship God, declaring that God is really among you. Father, help me to preach this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today, for a little bit, we're going to labor with this subject matter, the naked heart. The naked heart. Um, I love the word of God. It is more to me than a historic document and a conglomerate or a uh, nostalgic effort of authors and writers to tell God's story. I see it as living, breathing reality. I, I approach the word of God in and with that. Having said that, I think that there are some comparable issues that we need to explore when trying to understand the word of God. Forgive me if I'm not your most entertaining preacher. There may be times when I put toys and animals and tools on the stage, but there will be other times when I just teach you the word of God as is without the necessity of the circus. And the reason I want to do that is because I don't think the circus can keep you. Now, there are counterparts of mine in this generation that feel like in order to deliver you, I've got to entertain you. I think there's room for both. I can do something to captivate the eye and also do something to discipline the heart, but it is, it's, it's toxic to do one over the other. If, 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 if I give you too much toying and, 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 and scenery and, and, and lights and cameras. I'm going to distract you from the real intent. But the toys don't transform you. And I know you don't like that. And the, and the, and the, the, the artistry does not change you. There is a role and a room for that because of how we live in the generation we are in. But it's got to be teaching that transforms. Throw your hand up and say, yeah. We need Dr. Zarek to create uh, in the lives of men a hunger for transformative teaching, teaching that comes from the word of God. Well, people that say that they love Jesus are willing to learn him, not like him. And sometimes when we do the entertainment thing and we've got lions in the Barnum and Bailey coming from everywhere, what happens is we appeal to people that are not intending to change. They're intending to come to church. My goal is not to make more people <laughs> come to church. My goal is to transform the heart as by the word of God. And so because of that, we've got to dig a little deeper into the, the, the power of what we've been left with in the earth, which is the Bible, the Biblios, the collection, the books. And because of that, we're going today to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which is Paul's letters. And I want you to, I'm going to paint this for you before I land where I'm going. This is a real unique book, Elder Sean, and the reason it's a real unique book is because when we're dealing with, write this down if you are taking notes, when you're dealing with the subject of ecclesiology, that, that is the subject of church matter, scream yeah. Uh, church protocol, scream yeah. Church order, I said scream yeah church rule and way and custom, the Holy Spirit of God did not leave us without 
a system or a body of information on how we were to behave. You know, you would think as if that when you became saved and you accepted Jesus, that you customize your way into behavior. But the Bible leaves us with very candid laws and rules and customs and protocols on church law and behavior. We do not have a book like 1st and 2nd Corinthians that gives us church behavior, church law. Once you're saved by grace through faith, praise the name of our God, now you are indoctrinated into a system or a set of behaviors. Uh, because it's not just triumph about belief, it is also about behavior. And we've got to watch, listen, we've got to watch what the enemy is trying to trend right now in American culture. Ah, perhaps because of our last leadership regime where we're putting heavy emphasis on belief. As long as you believe, you can do whatever you want. Can I crack into Corinthians like I want to? But what the Apostle Paul teaches us through First and Second Corinthians is, yes, you can believe and you can receive, but it does not mean that you get the right to behave however you want. As a matter of fact, your behavior should be a byproduct of your belief. You won't help me in here. And, and, and we're in a culture, I'm going to take my time because I want to. We're in a culture that teaches that you can believe individually, you can be or behave individually, you can behave nationally, you can behave racially, you can behave emotionally as long as your belief is okay and what that means is this if I believe Jesus is the son of God you want some meat today or nah if, if, if Jesus is the son of God it doesn't matter what I smoke and it doesn't matter what I drink and it doesn't matter who I sleep with and it doesn't matter what I'm attracted to it doesn't matter what I'm addicted to it doesn't matter how I cope it doesn't matter how I talk it doesn't matter what I do when I wake up it doesn't matter what I do when I wake down because salvation of course I'm coming for you is a matter of my belief but what Paul does in the book of first and second Corinthians is he marries the conversation between belief and behavior and what he argues in these letters is yes your belief is paramount and your belief is fundamental but if your behavior is not going to change then you probably do not believe what you think you believe I know you want me to turn my plow but I won't see any in. I want Fox News. I want MTV and BET to let me know. I can trace, track, and trail your belief by looking at your behavior. The devil's a liar and so is his mother-in-law. You cannot behave how you want. Elder Candace said, I want this. And say you believe what we teach. The gospel as was first delivered was delivered at your belief system and when it hit your belief system the whole intent was to hit watch me your behavior now it does not mean that you don't get to explore Christian liberties but what we see in 1st Corinthians 2 and through uh, chapters 1 and 2 or segments 1 and 2 is a letter watch me from a man who was liberated by a gospel that was not incarcerated by the law of Moses Paul was not one of those that was imprisoned by the laws and the rudiments and the fundaments of Judaism. I'll get there. He was a recipient of the real gospel because he got it from Jesus Christ. And when he got it by revelation, Elder Candace, he then went and studied at the feet of a man by the name of Gamaliel, who was objective when it came to the presentation of the gospel. And so he studied in a desert away from the synagogue, away from the Jews, away from from the priests away from the Sanhedrin and anybody else that could cultivate his view on the gospel and when he came out of that desert season he had an understanding of the body of Christ an understanding of the grace of God and then what we see is he spends watch me a year and a half in a city called Corinth this was a very strategic journey he went on vacation 
he was on assignment he wasn't going somewhere because he needed somewhere to go this is one of the missionary trips of the apostle Paul with strategic intent he went to the city of Corinth because it was a strategic place it was a gateway Charles it was an opening they had casinos there and strip clubs there glory to the son of God it was a place of economic advancement there were very few ghettos there there was a place of exchange there was a place of real estate and economic development in Corinth so Corinth was not just a suburb where people would go because they had nice places it was a place of strategy it was a place of divine arrival now Paul spent a year and a half there and what he did was he invested himself stay with me in a community of people that were bound by both Roman and Greek gods this is history there were all kind of temples erected there in the name of Roman and Greek gods so there was no fidelity there was no loyalty this was a society that had a multiplicitous example and commitment to divers God there were rhetoricians there that would begin to speak in the name of whoever was the most popular and so Paul goes on a missionary or an apostolic journey for a year and a half and when he gets to Corinth he invests himself in the culture say yeah and uh, he preaches Jesus that's what I love I'm getting to my he, 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 he was like John Pastor Marva he did not he didn't see the need for series and he didn't see the need for graphics he had one message every Sunday in the same way that John the Baptist had one message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand when Paul arrived in the competitive culture of Corinth he had one word and the name of that word was Jesus this is why all throughout first and second Corinthians the apostle Paul is saying I don't want to know nothing else but Christ and him crucified he talked about the gospel of Jesus and you'll find out in the literary structure tiara of this book he points everything back to the gospel so here's how this book is written listen he has a problem he points to the person he addresses a problem he points to the person in five different segments of Paul's epistle to Corinth he identifies a problem and he points to the person and the name of the person uh, throw your hands up and just scream Jesus I hadn't heard it all year like I want to I said say Jesus because you know the problem with our gospel is it frankly don't have enough Jesus in it it's got a whole bunch of other stuff in it but there's not a love Jesus in it and the reason it don't have love Jesus in it is because people are afraid of the propaganda of Jesus the priority of Jesus Jesus, the message of Jesus but until our Christianity is Christ focused Christ ocentric Christ anchored Christ fundamental then what we have is a facade and a fraud so Paul spends a lot of time in Corinth by strategy as an apostle apostolos he sees that it's more beneficial of him listen baby bishop to spend his time in a place where people are spending money and people are investing and culture is developing and stars are coming and people are touring and you got all kinds of issues there the whole story of Corinth is found write this down in Acts 18 you find that the Apostle Paul writes about his missionary journey in the book of Acts. Now, if 1st and 2nd Corinthians is a perfect biblical example of ecclesiology, which is the doctrine of and the study of the church, uh, then I think it's prudent and I think it's wise to look at 1st and 2nd Corinthians to find and to trace and to track contemporary church ills issues and customs to what you and I face today. Now I've often said uh, it jokingly and sometimes seriously that the all nations worship assembly in every place she's going to be is just like the book of Corinth. If that makes you mad then so what? I, 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 I don't find another biblical example of the crazy, of the cruel, of the inconsistent, of the challenge, of the triumph, of the tradition, of 
the victory. We are Corinth. And I know for a lot of people that makes you mad because you have preferential treatment on sin. You think that your personal sin weighs more or weighs less than somebody else's sin. And so if somebody else's sin is not exactly like your sin, you get to get your ugly self in a pulpit and bash it or pray against it or prophesy against it and project your opinion because it's your experience with it. But when we're de dealing with ecclesiology, a part of what humbles us all is there are sins and issues that are native to anybody that names the Lord Jesus. The only difference is, watch me through here, you hide it better than other people. <laughs> And I know some of you nappy head people that judge people in the church for stuff your kids do. You got fornicators and liars and masturbators and all kind of stuff in your house, but you will get up and preach and teach and prophesy against people in the church because it gives you a better platform. Your problem is ignorance on ecclesiology. What that means is there is a gathering of people that come from all kind of stuff, that were born with all kind of tendencies, that have all kind of stuff in the flesh, all kind of stuff in the mind. What the church is, is a called out conglomerate of people that's struggling to find their way huh, out of the wickedness out of the tendencies and the iniquity ah, and what Corinthians shows us is the way out put your hand on your chest and say there is a way out I didn't hear you say there is a way out and so what happens is Paul 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 Paul, Paul establishes Corinthians and then he moves on after a year and a half listen to what I'm telling you he goes on in his mind and he starts to establish other churches so he's like all right uh, what I've done at Corinth is enough but I want to let you know a year and a half ain't long enough to establish a foundation and no heart I'm getting to my point a year and a half is not long enough to establish a pillar and no life if I've only taught you for a year and a half you've not even conceived the message long enough to allow it to form you and to shape you and to impact you I feel bad for those people yellow prophet that go to a church for a year and a half and then feel led to move on they, 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 they they're under a disciple for a year and a half and feel led to move on they, they're in a place for almost two years and all of a sudden the whirlwind of God comes to them the angel of the Lord comes to them and all of a sudden they are justified and moving and shifting before their roots got deep but the real problem is people don't like indoctrination they don't like what it is to be dug into to have your your beliefs challenges and your uh, philosophies established and so Paul was on his merry way uh, Maurice he got on the manga bus and he went to Galatia and he was on his way to wrong but all of a sudden I'm about to make you mad and I don't care my wife is waiting on me all of a sudden folks start calling him did you know deacon so-and-so was doing this behind your back I'm coming for you did you know elder so-and-so was saying this behind your back did you know that prophet is so-and-so uh, uh, was building off your work and off your momentum to try to make sure she could make money off of stuff she did not build and establish and, and, and they were crowning stuff and establishing kingdom upon your labor and your sacrifice and so Paul takes pen to paper and he says let me get this straight I'm going to write you an epistle because I want to make sure that you don't deviate from your foundation I want to make sure that you don't bastardize what was delivered to me in the desert scream preach so what I'm going to do is very directly very controversially I'm going to deal with your issues and your malady in a way that may make you uncomfortable and so in 1 Corinthians, I'm getting to my point, Jordan, uh, he divides it into five core subjects. Uh, if, if you are somebody who loves the word of God like me, you will appreciate the fact that the ecclesiastical book, uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians, uh, is a book that's both divided in five parts uh, because five is the number of grace. Uh, what it shows is that he writes this and he rebukes them, uh, he charges them, uh, he challenges them, uh, but because it's divided into five segments he's letting them know that you're only going to be able to achieve anything that I say in this book anything that I rebuke you in this reprimand it will only be done by the grace of God Paul had two messages in his life
life. Uh, one was the resurrected Christ Jesus uh, and the other one was the grace of God. Uh, this is why he saw the miracles uh, because he didn't go into how to find a lover. Uh, he preached Jesus and grace. Uh, he didn't go into finding your personality. Uh, he preached Jesus and grace. Uh, he didn't go into trying to figure out entrepreneurialism. Uh, he preached Jesus and grace uh, and the reason you're uncomfortable in these brown chairs uh, and watching me online uh, is because your gospel got 25 different versions uh, but I've only got two messages that come from my belly uh, and one of them is the name Jesus uh, the second one is the name grace uh, and it's one because of the other uh, and the other because of the one uh, I've resolved that there's only one thing to say to America can I preach like I want to uh, there's only one thing to say to the Republican uh, there's only one thing to say to the Democrat uh, there's only one thing to say to those that got the stimulus uh, there's only one thing to say to those uh, that got the shot uh, and to those that don't want it uh, and the name of what I've got to say uh, for the rest of my life uh, is if our gospel be hid uh, it is hid from those that are lost uh, because the God of this world uh, have blind the minds of those that don't believe uh, but the gospel to us they don't like it's too simple but the gospel unto us uh, it is the power of God uh, it's not just self help uh, it's not self improvement uh, it's not a new degree or a new status uh, it is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ you know why but because it is the power of God uh, unto salvation we've abandoned the gospel and Paul wanted to make sure that the church he planted did not abandon the gospel so what he does is he deals with these five core issues listen I'm almost at my point in the Christian community scream preach now 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 in, in, in chapters one through four I feel like preaching so I will in chapters one through four he deals with some stuff and you need history so shut up in chapters one through four what he deals with is division he, he shows that when you're dealing with a gifted community and a community that was redeemed and pulled out of several options of worship, Roman Greco style worship, what I've got to deal with is celebrity. I I've got to differentiate for you what it means for somebody to legitimately lay foundation and lay doctrine and lay teaching and for somebody to just want to be popular. Unfortunately, I've been raised up in a generation of preacher. I don't care if you don't like it. I've been raised up in a generation of preachers that's committed to making their name bigger than Jesus's. They've been committed to making and extending their brain uh, or their name or their brand uh, bigger than the gospel. And you fools follow it. You love to see it. You love when black men get big and popular. No matter what they're saying, you critique their doctrine not. You don't critique what they're saying. And so they expand their teaching. You follow it because you think it's practical. But your addiction to the pragmatic and your addiction to the practical has got you stuck in a whirlwind of delusion and antichrist deception and you don't even realize that the Christ you're following is not real. Ah, oh, what Paul deals with in chapters 1 through 4 of the book of 1 Corinthians is this. He said listen y'all, I planted this work, pay attention I planted this church signs and wonders and the gospel notwithstanding but my problem is I looked on Facebook and I looked on YouTube and I found Found out that y'all were fighting with each other. Here we go. Because some of you wanted Paul, and some of you wanted Apollos, and some of you wanted Peter. Well, what you did was you camped out uh, around the name of a man, uh, and you camped out around the name and the brand of a style, uh, and you started to pivot them against each other, uh, not knowing that it was the same Christ that called all of them. I know you want me to turn my plow. And so Paul goes back in his right and says, uh, This is not a celebrity fan. <laughs> I don't know what you think or what you're doing, uh, but the schism uh, and the division uh, and the divide that's in this church, uh, in this biblical template of historicity uh, and ecclesiology is uh, when I left, y'all got enticed and entertained with celebrity. And the basis of the division is uh, who you like to hear more, uh, who can hold his 
his ear more. I know you want me to turn my plow. Who can hoop the best? Who's got the best examples? Who's got the best relationships? And Paul says, no, let me get this straight with you. If you are one of those people in the church at Corinth and your idea of Christianity is the voice you get to say is your favorite and you make that an argument in the congregation, what's going to happen is you're going to end up giving birth with what I deal with in chapters 5 through 7. Pay attention. He goes from dealing with division and celebrity and the crave for popularity at 1 through 4. In 5 through 7, it changes Jordan. Now he's dealing with two common issues in every church. Inhale. Exhale. Set and perversion now I know that you think that's an all nations issue but, but, but what you don't realize is every church in America is dealing with the issue of the war in the members I don't care what you say what your offense is what your view is I could name thousands of churches that are dealing with the war in the members they wear it differently they walk it out differently they address it differently Ah, but what Paul shows us is where you've got division you're going to have perversion let me repeat it where you've got division you're going to have perversion there is no separation between the two the reason perversion can breed is because there's this gravitational pull and there's this magnetization towards personality this is exactly why we are done with personality driven ministry in this church ain't no more flyers I'm working in here ain't no more announcements ain't no more celebrity either you're going to serve and not be seen or you're not going to serve at all either you're going to work and not want the glory or you're not going to work at all either you're going to work unto the glory of God or you're going to try with your slick self to build a resume to walk over whoever you can to make Make yourself look wonderful the era where people use people to get up the ladder of church success and church visibility is done in this church we are working unto the glory of God serving unto the glory of God preaching unto the glory of God singing unto the glory of God praying unto the glory of God volunteering unto the glory of God worship unto the glory of God taking pictures unto the glory of God moving unto the is there anybody in here that only wants to do it for the glory of God all of this get a job I said get a job there are people who want to invoice you for passing out envelopes Low life. Get a job. This is ecclesiology. So he deals with sex. Sit down. I'm not done. He deals with perversion in chapters 5 through 7. Here's why. When you have filthy motives, filthy lucre, it manifests in the flesh. So you can have, I'm taking my time, you can, have, you can have a motive in one area that manifests in another area and it ends up with all kinds of seduction, all kind of filth. We had people in 1 Corinthians scream at me and say, preach. You had folks sleeping with their mother-in-law. You had incest. It's, it's, in, it's, it's in here and everywhere else. So you, 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 you had all kinds of orgies and, and, and then because of what Paul delivered, let's, let's keep this theologically integral. Because of the message Paul delivered, they would fall and justify it. They would say because we are free in Christ. <laughs> we don't have to make recompense or deal with our lawless behavior in the flesh. 
And, and so Paul started to write this epistle like, y'all, you, 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 you know, th this is not exactly what I intended. First of all, you got this personality addiction. Second of all, now I'm dealing with this sexual issue. And then here is a very unpopular one, Pastor Josh. Right after it went sexual, it, it became an issue of food. In, 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 in chapters 8 through 10, don't lock up. A part of what he's discussing is food dedicated to idols, and here's why. In Roman Greco culture, pay attention and learn something. In Roman Gre Greco culture, just like today, this is why this is the perfect book for understanding the theology of the church. In Roman Greco culture, a major part of fellowship and worship was food. You know, in the same way today somebody dies, our immediate response is chicken. If somebody dies, we want to go get pound cake. Before we say, I'm sorry for your loss, we immediately go and try to find a 7-Up cake or some form of Harold's or something, and we just want to feed you. And, then, and we do it every day, if I'm honest. This is not a new trend. Talk to me. This is something we've been doing for generations. And so in the same way, in Corinth, what would happen was when there were disputes or when there was fellowship, there would also be food. But the problem with that is this, those that were Jewish Christians and those that were Gentile Christians would come together and there was a schism, there was a divide on what types of food they can eat. Scream, yeah. And so what happened is uh, the, the redeemed Christians or the New Testament Christians or the Jewish Christians, what they would do was they would start to judge the folk that was eating the foods that was, quote, Ross, dedicated to idols. So the way it worked in Roman Greco culture culture was I would have some bread or some wine or some chicken or some fish and I would dedicate it to a God and if I dedicated to a God and brought it to my Christian banquet those that were baptized in Jesus name you don't want to talk to me those that didn't believe in wearing pants to church and those that didn't believe that women could preach and those that didn't believe that you could be saved and without speaking in tongues if we were all in the room here's what happened there was now a status war in the church of God there was a status war I'm getting to my point but it's important that you know why this is important because what Paul is dealing with in the letter of ecclesiology is I have a problem with y'all's understanding of status uh, th there's several issues and there's several items uh, that have made y'all tear each other off from each other and uh, one of them is what you eat and what you don't your preferences you drink wine you don't you, you you go to the club you don't you go to the movie you don't and in the middle of this is the cross and because both of you would go to hell without it I don't understand how I Either of you tear off it, Lord they don't want to talk to me I don't understand how either one of you use this as a premise for judgment for either one of you this is the theme of the book of Corinthians and so he deals with food after this sacrifice to idols this is how we got to the communion conversation I'm almost there because he says yo if y'all can't agree about whether or not pork is good if y'all can't agree about whether or not flaming hot is good if you want to be vegan if you want to do all of that then I tell you one thing Thing. let's have a meal that all of us can have if you don't want to eat chicken if you don't want to eat beef if you don't want to eat on the sabbath let's come together and eat the lamb and this this way we can centralize ourselves and so now in the books of first and second corinthians we have a church based theology that levels us all out lift your hands say we're all the same i'm almost in my text and i know you don't want to say that say we're all the same I don't give a nickel's worth of dog meat if you're an apostle, if you're a prophet, if you're an evangelist, if you're a pastor, if you're a teacher, if you're an intercessor, you have a propensity to crazy and you have a propensity to sin. You have a propensity to weakness and if you don't humble your proud self under the doctrine of ecclesiology, you've ejected yourself from the work of the church, which is grace in you. Now, we, we may not all function the same. Can I preach like I want to? We, we may not all function the same. We may differ, Pastor Dalcor, in our levels and realms of authority. But our souls need the same blood. Our hearts need the same word. The reason this is important because we get into a really weird situation. You ready for me? I'm almost done, in chapters 11 through 14. This situation is like, 
Oh, okay, okay. You got incest, rape, drug addiction, abuse, pornography, orgies, mushrooms, crackhead, meth. But you prophesy. I said what I said. You move in tongues and interpretation. You, you, you have a supernatural inclination to invisible things. And sometimes you do so while you're drunk. Or, or while you're high. And, and some of you idiots believe that it actually sensitizes you to the spiritual world. You think that that's God's preferential escort into the invisible. This is in First and Second Corinthians. You convince yourself that in order to understand God, you've got to have an out-of-body experience. And so Paul steps in here like, hey, pursue love. I'm talking about 11 through 14. If, if, if you pursue love, I'm going to take my time. You're not going to need to be addicted to anything else. Because the real truth, throw your hands up and scream, preach. You're not looking for inebriation and intoxication. You're looking for love. And what happens is because you're not pursuing love, you're pursuing its alternate, which is inebriation. That means the alternate of inebriation is the love of God. So what happens is when you get inebriated and you come out of yourself and you get addicted and you get drawn away, you feel love because you don't feel nothing. Nothing. Pursue love and, and, and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you would prophesy. That's 11 through 14. There is now, this is a word, Pastor Marble, you know me and you old school. There's a word y'all don't like. Order. <laughs> Shabelle, they don't want to hear me. I said there's a whole doctrine called church order. I know you don't like it. You like church freedom. You like everything else but church order. And a part of Ecclesiastes or a part of the ecclesiology is a doctrine of church order. So he deals with in 11 through 14 the gathering, the possibilities, the social positioning because here's the real truth. Inhale exhale consecration is going to cost you social expenses when you really say i know you want me to turn my plow but i can't do it there's no way in the world you're going to really be consecrated and not have a social consequence it's always going to be that when the lord says i'm heavy on this right now i'm pulling you here right now i'm saying this right now your company is going to change why do i feel like i'm proper sorry I, in the name of jesus i prophesy the courage to change the company because of the consecration because of the elevation because of the lifting up you're getting ready to come out from among them so in 11 through 14 there are regulations protocols and orders and it has everything to do with spiritual activity can I go deeper the final two segments of 1 Corinthians is the resurrection in chapter 15 or the third or the fifth close, he deals with the resurrection and then he gives him a final condemnation of the conflict. Here is a problem. We're seeing right now in the doctrine of, say, ecclesiology. Say, ecclesiology, which is the law, the life, the way of the church. He's dealing with this and he has church life, church order, church protocol, church behavior, but you've got an issue. The issue is these people are highly supernatural. They, they speak in tongues, they have dreams, they have visions, they can be real high on crack, meth, and win Grammys. They can write, Xavier, beautiful songs, and be strippers by night. They can pray. Prophet Ashley, I know you know, and bind and loose and decree and declare and be texting their immediate after church meeting. Some of them have the um, unmitigated gall to text each other in church. 
I've seen it in the spirit. They're on row seven, you're on row two. And you're like, hey, where are we going after this? That is Corinth. It's not new. But 1 Corinthians 14, China, is, is, is where this conversation gets really rich because it shows that even though you've got this, these layers of, of dirt and sin and bondage and iniquity, there is a technology. Hmm. There's a resource. There's a power. There's an ability. There's an accompaniment in this environment that can reach the heart. What I've shown you is the book of 1 Corinthians is about ecclesiology, but what's considerate and what's consistent is the heart. Because the issue of addiction is an issue of the heart. The issue of bitterness is an issue of the heart. The issue of who you choose relationally is an issue of the heart. I want to journey peradventure to another segment of scripture that is eerily consistent with where we are in 1 Corinthians 14. Can I do that for a minute? You ain't got a ways to go. Uh, and, 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 and it's 1 Samuel 10. Don't go there. 1 Samuel 10 is a story, Pastor Josh, of a king in the making. It gives us a guide for what happens around kings in the making. Put your hand on your own chest because you're tired. Say, I'm in the making. Open your mouth, say, I'm in the making. A lot of people don't like being in the making. They like being on the way. They don't like being in the making because when you're in the making, there are things that happen around you. There's an activity around you that God schedules, that God plans. There are things that God says. There are things that God allows. There are things that God restricts when you're in the making. And uh, what we're serving is a people in the making. We're, we're dealing with people in the making, with fathers in the making, husbands in the making, wives in the making. And, and, and what First Samuel 10 shows me, just stay with me, is what God does when somebody is in the making. Number one, he addresses them where they are. He does not overextend or go beyond where they're not. He deals with them exactly where they are. What that means is if and when and where the word of the Lord comes to you, it's not necessarily going to reach above or ahead. It's going to deal with you where you at there's nothing God won't talk about I, they don't want me to talk about this friend but he'll deal with your ideas about your body your ideas about your complexion your ideas about your singleness your ideas about your call he'll deal with your issues and your resentments about your future your past he'll deal with like, why you don't like your mama why you don't like your dad he'll deal with why you don't like your hair tight why you don't like your credit score he's going to find you right where you are because you're in the making and when you're in the making he cannot evade where you are so the word of the Lord will land right there scream at me and say yeah. And then I find this other consistent issue because we're dealing with the heart now. We, 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 we cracked into something which is maybe the doctrine of ecclesiology is really the doctrine of the heart. They don't want that. And so a part of what we're seeing now is when God is dealing with and making a king, he does not deal with their personality first. And he does not deal with their, their, their regalia first and their external. The first thing that God does when he's making a king is reaches the heart. Because kings don't lead from scepters. Kings don't lead from rings. Kings lead from the heart. The problem is you want a throne. You don't want to have the heart dealt with. And, and I'm finding, because I'm studying this as a biblicist, this issue of the heart is consistent because, you know, I, I studied the story of Saul, and it's always blessed me. It's one of my most favorite stories, and what I'm learning is... Samuel stood flat foot and began to prophesy, go here and do this and you'll find them and they'll find you and this is going to happen. And all of that is impressive, the word of knowledge, the powerful demonstration of the gifts of the spirit. But not as impressive as what happened to Saul when he left the instruction. Here is my point. If you can't handle instruction, your heart will never be changed. The point and the purpose of instruction is to change the heart. Think about where we are in this generation, a numbness to instruction, 
a defiance against instruction, a, an insensitivity to instruction. And it's the enemy's goal, not just make you disobedient, but to keep your heart the same. Ask me why. Because the Bible says that the reason why Israel did not come into everything they could have come into was because of their heart. It wasn't just because they want figs and honey and milk. He said, I've got to give you a new heart. The journey is such and the way is such that I've got to take out one heart from you and give you a new heart in you because this new heart comes with a sensitivity to instruction. So if you ask me, what's most important to you about what happened in 1 Samuel 10 is this. One Saul turned away from Samuel. The Bible said God gave him a new heart because he couldn't reign with the heart he had. He couldn't lead with the heart he had. He couldn't decide with the heart he had. And so it was not just prophecy tricks. It was the word of the Lord as aimed at the heart. If we move this now to 1 Corinthians 14, we've got a real intriguing issue, which is this. Paul is writing, I've situated this for you. Hopefully you're intelligent enough to see why this is substantial. We're dealing with spiritual phenomena. Scream, yeah. yeah. We're dealing with spiritual protocols. Say, yeah. yeah. We're dealing with the possibility of spiritual distraction because some of us could be distracted by how people speak in tongues. We don't know who's in there. But they get up and talk in tongue hard enough, we could be like, oh, surely this is God. And Paul gives us possibility. Hear me. The possibility Paul gives us is this. If all of y'all come together and say, how little was, how little was, say audience. Last week, I taught you scene, setting, scenario in scriptural interpretation. Today, I'm teaching you audience. He gives two words, Elder Talent. That's weird. I'm almost out your hair. Unbe the, the KJV says unbeliever or unlearned. Unbeliever or unlearned. The Amplified, as we read, it says unbeliever or outsider unbeliever or outsider how many audiences did i just give you two he says if an unbeliever or one unlearned or an unbeliever or an outsider comes in and you are all competing for that microphone a talking tongue he gonna say y'all crazy because they ain't getting you no money that's not moving you forward in life that's not an indicator of how you are emotionally or how you are as a person y'all crazy this is not the real world but if everybody's prophesying, talking about what the Lord is going to do for the future, sharing, this is what your Bible says in this context, a new message from God. Something happens. Inhale. Here's my whole message. Nobody told me that the heart could have regalia. I didn't know that the heart could have outfits, clothes, aesthetics costumes <laughs> fashion because the way Paul writes this Jordan is real weird he says if an unbeliever or an outsider because that's who the pandemic put us in front of they come in and y'all start prophesying this is who you are this is where you're going this is what the Lord wants number one he falls to his face the secrets of his heart are laid bare. Say naked heart. What is a naked heart? And how do we get to it? If you think about your own life, your own journey, your own story, I could give you mine, but I don't feel like it. I could remember several moments when my heart had on clothes. made up pretty enough for people to see or want or to accept. But what Paul shows us is where there is a real prophetic anointing, God's talking in the midst of his people, part of what it does is makes the heart naked. What happened to Saul in 1 Samuel 10 was that his heart took off clothes. Samuel started to prophesy and say, this ain't you. You don't want no darn donkeys. You're not really mad at your daddy. You're king. And you're mad at it. You're destined. And you don't like it. 
You're being trained and you got an attitude about it. Don't like your regulation. Don't like your prerequisites. Don't like the social consequence of your destiny. And so I'm prophesying to strip your heart. My submission to you is that you're only going as far as the nakedness of the heart. I've read this over and over again, and I've never realized what Paul said. The secrets of his heart, his heart was made bare. I wonder what the prophetic word took off. But whatever it took off made him convicted. The Bible says the unbeliever or the one unlearned said, God is here. And I know he's here because he didn't strip my heart bare naked. We're in a generation of hearts that are on the runway, modeling, fashioning, taking on appearances and clothes for the sake of acceptance or for the sake of culture, whatever, or fear. And there's this consistent relationship. Prophet Arian, how you doing? In the scriptures between prophecy and the heart. You know my problem with you prophetic people? You think it's the mind of God alone. It's the heart of God. There's a lot of people that can crack into what God is thinking. Very few people can crack into what he's feeling. And there's a lot of people that say what he's thinking, but don't know how to convey how he feels. And this is why it's important post-pandemic that we move prophetically and sing prophetically and behave prophetically because it's the heart of God that's under attack. It's not his mind. People can justify or rationalize. Well, he's probably thinking this, but in the book of 1 Corinthians, what he shows is heart-to-heart conversation between heaven and earth, between God and an unbeliever. And if not an unbeliever, an outsider. People probably feel like an outsider because of what's on the heart. Well, Dr. Stevens, <laughs> please put an S-O-N on my name. I'm sick of y'all of it that's enough but but a part of what's part of what's on the heart is grief it's an outfit um one of the cutest outfits rodney for i called you Rodney. one of the cutest outfits for the heart is disappointment because it's not always obvious what I love, remember the days of Ford City when you were caking and flirting. And uh, you would have a girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever your thing is, and, and y'all, would dr- y'all would dress alike. What happens when your heart got on matching outfits? Like when it's grief and depression and resentment and... All of that there, it just looks real good. A part of what the prophetic word does is make you not look good. (laughs) If you come in a real prophetic environment, it's going to strip you. This is why the devil wants to make a toy of it, Radiant. They want people to play with it. The Lord says seven is the number of completion. You're moving into completion. What does that mean? But then you start digging a bit. And you reach not just for the mind of God, but you reach for the heart of God in the life of a person. First thing that's going to happen, the clothes are coming off that heart. Those two audiences are before us now. They're watching me right now online. They're getting ready for us for 2022. And I want to know if we got a word. It's a simple thing, but it's not. (laughs) Because the real truth is people don't got a word. You ain't saying nothing. You're saying nothing. You're preaching the pandemic. You're singing the pandemic. Is there any word from the Lord? And if there is, can it strip the heart down to the type of nakedness that deliverance requires? We've been running from nakedness since Eden. And God's been trying to get us back to nakedness for centuries, but we don't like it. We like pretension, presumption, protection, because nakedness is scary. It is true. I know, Shirley, you're watching me right now. Nakedness is scary. 
The dangerous thing about going into a spirit-filled church that hears the voice of the Lord is that it's going to push you to nakedness. Because that's the only way we can really get you to go where God wants you to go. This is the word of the Lord, naked hearts. The quarantine has given us an opportunity to put a lot of stuff on. Ross, some of us have put on career stuff. It, it, you know, it, the way it looks, John, John, is we occupy like, so like, let me do this or date this or go here or be there. I need to find a way because solitary confinement is a real issue of torment. So being apart from and away from people is not how we were designed to live. So when that has been your reality for a year, it's been 12 months that we put stuff on. But the word of the Lord is roaming, trying to figure out if there's a heart I can undress. I want a naked heart. And the reason I want a naked heart is because I can't heal with them clothes on. I, I can't deliver. And, and what I love is that these audiences, the unbeliever or one unlearned, is unused, watch me, to having the heart confronted. So when the heart is confronted, which is a biblical thing, when the heart is confronted, first thing he does is fall. He falls. He's like, whoa, where did that come from? He falls to him face and says, God is here. And I know he's here because I can't hide anymore. He confesses that God is here and the secrets of his heart are laid bare. When you're dealing with the real prophetic movement, prophet Ty, they don't like that. The real, pro I'm not talking about Son or daughter, yea, yea, I say unto thee, you shall have a car in three months. That's good. I mean, okay. I'm with a real prophetic movement. What it's going to do is reach for the heart of a man. And it's going to connect heart to heart from God to yours about what he's thinking, what he's feeling, what he wants out of you. And, and here's what it's going to do. It's going to bypass your guards. What 1 Corinthians 14 shows is that the Apostle Paul says if you move, in such a way, in the prophetic, it will bypass your guards. Do you know a person that's guarded? Talk to me. Even against God, that's worshiping kind of like this, praising kind of like this. They like touch everything, talk to everything, leave that alone. But there's no way I can really get you to destiny why are you dodging me? And what's happened in 2020 is that a whole generation was born that was groomed to dodge God. Yesterday, Elder Josh, and, and now I'm going to wax prophetic, I, I, um, I started to get grieved about the children born in the pandemic. Um, I don't know what generation Heggie would have to tell me. I, I don't know. It's not X. It's another generation. But I started to think about, you know, when Joshua got old, and the Bible says he stood and he was in front of a gen generation that knew not the Lord. I don't think people are realizing that when you birth a generation in a quarantine, you have to work hard to ingrain them in the necessity of relationship. They, they only know you and them. And so it creates a whole bunch of risks, socially speaking. So I start to cry out, like, Lord, um, Pastor Hegwood, if he's watching this, I don't know if he is, he gave birth to a baby boy a couple weeks ago. They brought him to my house. They brought the baby. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. They brought the baby um, to my den. I was there reading the scriptures. And they, they gave him to me. They presented him to me. And I wept so bad. I started to cave. I could barely breathe. And I'm like, Lord, what the heck is happening to me? I'm not like this. And the Lord began to deal with me. He said, this is who you're pastoring. <laughs> I've raised you for this generation. This is who will study you. Live for them. Study for them. So I started to think about the dangers of not prophesying and not speaking prophetically. Listen, and not knowing prophetically. Because there's certain things we need to know prophetically. And there are people under the sound of my voice that need to repent. 
for willingly not being as prophetic as they could be because of the responsibility that comes with it. You know, when you're somebody that's called to hear from God, it comes with a lot. It does a lot. It's a heavy thing, Vicki. You know the voice of the Lord. It's, it, I don't know why people think it's cute. Cop house all you want. Patreon all you want. But there's a species of us that still tremble when he starts talking. You will see the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God is what you will see. He will be faithful to you. You need not fear. You need not sink. You need not cower. God's promise to you is you will see the faithfulness of God. It will be in the same way that he commanded his faithfulness toward Abraham. The faithfulness of God. Step by step. Day by day. There is a, naked, a nakedness coming to your heart. And it's a necessary nakedness for what he's got planned for you. Don't fear it. He will be in your midst like a strong mountain. And you will hide behind him and he'll show you the way in which you will go. And though the day get dark and though the day get gloomy, your heart will not fret or fear. For he's going to stand up around you and, and, and uphold you. And it will not be said of you that you lost your mind. You're not going to lose your sanity. You, you will not cave in mentally. And it will not be that you have more bad memories than good. It will be that the faithfulness of God upholds you. And it will be that the faithfulness of God substantiates you. Prepare yourself. By September, you'll smile. By September, you'll laugh. By September, you'll dance. It will be that the joy of the Lord is around about you and you'll learn and you'll grow and your roots will not wither. And there'll be brand new relationships that come in your life. Though, though the pain is imminent and it's deep and it's kept you from sleep and rest, the Lord shows me that you've not had rest in weeks. He shows me that you can barely fall asleep, that you're constantly waking up at two and three and four in the morning. And it's difficult for you to get real rest. He's going to gift you with rest. It's going to be that he relieves you of, of the temptation of staying up all night to worry about that that is beyond your control. The brothers are coming. The brothers are coming. The support is coming. The confidants are coming. And the enemy would make it seem like you've wasted years. But the Lord says nothing has been unto waste. It's been before me like a sweet incense. And it's been before me like a fragrant offering. But I will not leave you to die. I will not leave you to die. As a matter of fact, you spirit of death, I see you. <laughs> I see you trying to convince him out of life. I curse you in the name of Jesus, who is the son of God. I curse you right now. And not only will he live and not have a stroke and not have a heart attack. And he will not go to bed and die in his sleep, but he'll have the peace of God. I declare that, I prophesy that. The nakedness of this heart in the name of the Lord Jesus. I lose that. Wow. Yeah. A brand new, a brand new life. A brand new life. A brand new life. I declare that to you. A brand new life. A brand new life, a brand new life, a brand new life, a brand new life, a brand new life. I prophesy it. Give me a minute, y'all. A brand new life, a brand new life, a life beyond iniquity and a life beyond the waters of a Pharaoh, a brand new life. I declare that unto you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, and I just bind and break the effects. 
the effects of the antagonist from Houston against you. The fear that their narrative has prevailed and your desire to uphold and protect your own name. Let the Lord fight for you. And he's going to uphold you. He's not, oh, he's not done with you. I prophesy that. I see that. He's not done. There are new assignments coming. I prophesy that. New relationships coming. Uh, uh, new opportunities coming. New insight coming to you. Uh, the new opening of the ear. Through the nakedness of the heart is going to restore you in a brand new way. I see a, uh, uh, y'all mind if I prophesy for a minute? I see a company being given to you. It, it, this is not going to be your own work, but you're in 2022, you're moving into that season of the vineyard you didn't plant, the well you didn't dig, the house you didn't build. And it will be said that this was the year that you built with what you know to build and you establish with what you know to establish but there is a greater thing a new thing springing forth and it will be that they come from afar that that there is the retirement of one that will be the catalyst of another and you will find that the spirit of god gives you such responsibility it's going to scare you it's going to it's going to catalyze you and i see some prerogatives and some agendas in dc the Lord has need of you, son. And th the day is going to come when you're going to have to speak on issues that make you uncomfortable. And you're going to have to be the face of things that you don't prefer to be the face of. But the Lord's going to teach you how to balance the heart and the arm. For there is a war between the heart and the arm. The arm has great ability to withhold and to uphold. But the heart has struggled with priority and, and, and holding. Praise the name of the Lord. But the Lord's going to marry the heart and the arm. And you're going to find that it's easier for you to be more supported in this season than you've ever been before. And in April of next year, a sudden family change happens. Something comes. Something transpires. Where you're going to feel like pressure is upon you in a way you've not seen. But if you will return to prayer now, you'll be ready for the change. The Lord wants me to tell you this. You've been way too braced for what he wants. Way too braced. I don't exactly know what that means, but he wants you to know you've been way too braced. Get naked again. Because something's about to call you. Something of a massive amount is about to call you. And when it does, the promise of the Lord concerning you is that you'll be ready. You'll be ready. Sugar, who is Leslie? Is that your name? Come to me. Give me a minute. Now. You have a daughter? Lift your hands, baby. God's concern about how hard you are on yourself with the raising of your daughter. You are of a descent where silence is normal and where we feel it and we have it, but we will not talk about it. If for any reason we need to go offline, we can, because I'm going to probably prophesy a while. I feel something heavy coming on me. Um, but you've not filled your child. It, it, what the enemy has done is made you feel like because you needed to commit a season to your studies, you needed to commit a season to your work, and you also needed to commit a season to the development of this not-for-profit that you were not giving your daughter as much time as she needed, particularly during the pandemic. But what the Lord wants you to know is you've not failed her. There has been a grooming in the dark that God has been doing. And you have even, over the last week, contemplated getting off of worship and getting off of music to see if you had too much on your plate. And the Lord would say, not so. As you, as you serve and sing in worship, the Lord is creating within you a deep capacity 
Um, he says four years he's been doing a thing in you four years and he's not going to allow your daughter to be thrown off or over to the forces of the wicked one and he's not going to allow her to suffer the provisional needs that you consider I see you googling a tutor and googling someone to help come alongside and the Lord says I've already gripped and grasped one to come alongside to help you wait two weeks <laughs> And something's going to begin to transpire. And it will be said of you that as you avail your heart to the Lord for his purpose for you, that you will begin to see the hand of the Lord in the life of your daughter. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling now. I hear Spanish speaking people. I don't know if this is Morales. But I hear Spanish speaking family members of a, either a Dominican or Puerto Rican nature. And what I'm hearing is there was a denial of you. Someone denied you. And the Lord wants you to know you're coming into full sonship, sweetheart. You're, going, you're coming into ownership and sonship and inheritance. And whatever has happened that robbed you, woohoo, that robbed you of your experiences as a woman and a daughter that landed you up at North Park. I don't know what that means to you at the university up north the thing that uh, uh, you, you couldn't allow yourself to fully explore these are going to be the days of full adventure and full exploration don't be sad baby rejoice God's gonna turn this thing over even with the close of this lease the Lord says what he's promised you is your own you're coming into your own come on put those hands together for the Lord all over whoa, all, whoa, all over this building come on put those hands together for Jesus he's moving by his spirit um, uh, Bradley come to me the obstacle the obstruction the wall the mount in the way yesterday at 11 48 p.m the spirit of the lord brought it down and made it low you're not going to have to travel to and fro <laughs> Except the Spirit of God. I see travel that exhausts you. Uh, probably about two to three hundred dollars a week is what the Lord shows me. And uh, what the Lord says is that last night, right before midnight, He touched the heart of one concerning you. And uh, the travel to and fro is not going to be anymore. For there's work for you to do among uh, the youth of this church and uh, the young adults. There's a message, there's a word, there's a phrase. And the Spirit of God says the gawking that's the gawking the mocking the laughing of your family in another place concerning your travel uh, back and forth here the Spirit of the Lord says watch and see how I will embarrass naysayers for a man that breaks himself before me and because of your fasting this is what he's saying because of your fasting and your uh, turning over of the plate I'm going to begin to answer you in in, in more ways than you had ever dreamed do not give up for you had given the Lord a deadline and you had said uh, uh, that I'm going to give this uh, until May of this year before I go back to my father's house uh, and the Lord says to tell you not so for I've already situated and prepared the kinds of provision uh, the kinds of resources but also the kind of job that's reflective of what you need to go in ministry I sent you here you didn't go on your own so rejoice in that peace and in that confidence and in that great uh, power because my hand is coming upon you of a provisional nature and it's happening effective immediately come on put those hands together for the Lord oh put those hands together for Jesus come on uh, who is uh, uh, Bree come here sweetheart Praise the name of the Lord. The Father wants you to know that there is no return and, and there is no going back. 
and, and, and there is no surrendering to the thing that calls you something has been trying to call you and it's not even been trying to entice you slickly it's been very flagrant and the Lord wants me to just tell you very fragrantly cancel that trip you're not going there I know you think you need palm trees and you need some beach time but the Holy Ghost warns you don't do that uh, because it's the enemy's way of trying to tie you uh, and and if you go to Florida what's going to happen is you're going to lose two years of your journey if you go back and the Lord doesn't want you to go back he wants you moving forward because there's opportunity before you that you don't see it's obvious it's apparent but you've been too afraid to walk in it uh, but right now we open up the doors of wisdom I open it prophetically to you in sight woo, woo! knowledge and understanding and real friends I command the spirit and power of betrayal that's been consistent around you and attaching to you to be broken by the powerful name of Jesus and real friends oh yeah real friends real friends and the Lord says if you apply for this degree one more time and don't commit all the way to it you're not going to be able to move it but I see a masters and I see what the Lord has been trying to do is get you to focus but you're so afraid to be by yourself that you've been afraid to commit to it but the Spirit of the Lord God is going to give you the time and the day that's what I hear and I see you moving from the north to the south I don't know what that means but he says I'm pulling you from the north to the south get ready to go to the city and the Lord is going to pull you around those that can watch and drive past to make sure you're not doing what the enemy is trying to entice you into come on put those hands together for the Lord all over this building uh, Marcus come here son the vow it's the vow it's the vow of the heart the vow of the heart lift your hands to him the Lord wants me to warn you I don't know why I'm moving in this right now but God God wants me to warn you that you can't have vows against him and you've made inward promises against the Lord you've made a solemn contract against the Lord that you would not do and you would not be who he called you to be because of what it comes with and you've also told the Lord that because you're sick of familial persecution right off of North Avenue is what I see the Lord wants you to know that he's not going to change his mind concerning what he called you to do because you're tired of who persecutes you from it the nakedness of the heart you have an uncle that's a crack addict that talks to himself and is out of his mind and you consistently run from examples and you consistently run from fears of uh, those type of people in your family because you don't want to be them and you don't want to do them but the Lord would say to you son not only am I not changing my mind about who you are I'm going to give you the grace to complete because you're not a bum and, you, and, 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 and you're not a loser and you're not slow and you don't have a reading impediment what the Lord wants you to know is there's a work of grace that he's been trying to do on you but you won't sit still you won't be still and the reason you won't be still is because you're tired of being responsible. Whatever your mama did to you. She has not been a woman since she was 11 years old. And because an 11 year old raised you, you have these emptinesses and these voids in you. But you don't know what her father did to her. <laughs> And because of that, you've raised yourself and you're tired. You're weary. But there is a call of God upon you stronger than you could ever imagine. I see an approval for an apartment that the Lord says you're supposed to cancel. He wants you to move to a different area, not this one. And because he's trying to protect you and he's trying to move you in a new direction for your safety for covenant and brotherhood father will you do a thing now and, and no georgia no georgia no georgia
wants to finish what he started in you. Baby, will you stand here? Come here. There is a, um, there is a career crisis that's on your heart. It's come up before the Lord. It's a career crisis and, and um, it has everything to do with the necessity of a degree program and it has everything also to do uh, with a, uh, an internship and some hours. I see the number 40. And what the Lord is showing me is that he's about to change some things because you've been faithful. And I hope this doesn't embarrass you, baby, but chaste. <laughs> I see the wolf coming behind your bed. <laughs> and you turn your ear away. The Lord wants you to know he's going to give you the wisdom that you need. But it is imperative that you get rid of the deadlines. It's imperative that you cast your calendar before him. It's absolutely essential that you give him that. Because you are an easy stressor, um, even when you're done with this degree, there's two more. And so the Lord wants you to have a pressure point that's reliable for what he wants you to do in this nation and abroad. And today we just kill the voice of the inner critic right now. The voice that says you should have been done. You've asked for two extensions. That uh, Jewish professor lady is consistently bullying me about my deadlines and timelines. Honey, the Lord is not ignoring you. He sees you where you are with what you need. Take your time. Take your time. Take your time. Take your time. Dora, the call of God is coming to a ripeness. You're not going to be able to run from this. You're not going to be able to ignore it. And the Lord says the enemy's weapon against you is regret. Okay. But what the Spirit of God is going to do is do something in your meditation. You know of what I speak. There is a, there is a meditation, a contemplation. The sun meets you almost with bullying, torment. And what the Lord wants you to know is he's visiting. He's visiting you in prayer in such a way where what you think is shame and what you think is reproach and what you think is embarrassment is broken off of you. And a yieldedness is being born for ministry, for the call of God. A yieldedness is being born in you to, to cry and to pray. The Lord says, pace yourself in the realm of your emotions. And God says, I'm going to highlight and I'm going to send a therapist to you that's going to be a tremendous help to you being able to recover from who you were and, and who you used to be. And, 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 and you're going to, the, I see a lock on your heart being opened. And the Lord says, as you open this, you're going to get the love you need. Don't fear living without it. Don't fear not having it. In the name of Jesus, even whatever happened this week that made you want to just run, I feel like Wednesday, the Lord says to tell you, he, He's going to give you the type of peace that, on, that only could come from Him. It's in Him. Oh, shut your hand. I said it's in him. 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 And he's going to give you the peace you need. Don't run. Don't rebel. Obey him. And you're going to find the type of peace that surpasses all understanding. Sabrina, do you have a brother? Come here. You've been uh, not sharing with people about the dangers that you fear for your brother. There's great danger, great danger around them. Great danger, great betrayal, and uh, great deception even around them. And you've been getting a feeling that if he didn't make certain changes, that something would happen to him. And the Lord says, you warned your mother, you started to complain, but they think you're crazy. They see you as a fanatic, but God's gonna give you a kind of wisdom specifically for your siblings. Uh, 
Something's happening over the next 12 months of your life where you will no longer be seen as the wow, fighting, irrational Sabrina. You're going to be clothed with the spirit of wisdom for your siblings first. Praise the name of the Lord. Um, and, 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 and God says it's going to be through the patient conversations because the Lord says your ear has been impatient. It's going to be through the patient conversations that you legitimately spare your brother's life. And not only are you going to spare your brother's life, you're going to give him the grace to, to discontinue criminal activity. Uh, there is something deceptive going on underground. And the Lord says your wisdom is going to give you the grace to spare him. And I see a pending abortion. Holy Spirit says, if you will talk and if you will begin to describe, I'll give you grace to preserve lives. You convince your siblings not to shed innocent blood. And it will be said of you that through your intercession and through your prayers that God spares the life of your siblings. And the Lord wants me to yell this at you. Be Joseph! And don't be afraid of it. And don't be mad at it. You're about to be moved to a regional supervisor. Something's going to happen in your professional year where you're going to have responsibility for several locations and several areas and several teams. And the Lord says, if you will humble yourself before me, I'm getting ready to favor you in a way you have not dreamed of before. But obey him. Times of fasting. Times of fasting. And times of prayer have come before you. And if you do this, I'll anchor you in a way you've never seen before. That's the word of the Lord concerning you. Paul, come here. Father, thank the, the Lord says to tell you, first of all, hi. The Lord says to tell you he's not afraid of your questions. The your considerations about movement and marriage and where to go and if to start over the Lord says to tell you he's not intimidated by them but today by the power of the prophetic word I strip your heart naked he wants to let you know he's not going to leave you okay and the the grief that you feel that's it's overwhelming it's it's consistent it's annual the Lord's delivering you from elongated grief because it's not just grief of your father it's grief of your grandfather and it's it's grief of your story it's grief of college uh, uh, it, it's it's grief from job it's grief from mentor it's grief the Lord's going to set you free and the Lord says if you will follow him in three years time you'll be more wealthy than you could ever have dreamed there is a thing that the Lord wants to do with you through multiple business and multiple endeavor that the enemy through the power of Delilah has tried to seduce you out of for seven years but if you will cut the cord the Lord says end it now and the Lord says if you will cut the cord you'll wow I'm your legacy something you don't think of very often but your legacy will be very great he'll set up for you a power and a people and a story that will bless you beyond your words father i thank you for the journey you have him on in the name of jesus i honor you for what you're doing in him in jesus name amen come on put those hands together for the lord will you Put those hands together for Jesus, will you? The, the season of which way do I go? Where do I turn? It's done. You've been living in confusion for 90 days now because of conflict of opportunity and trying to figure out which way is the right way to go. But the first thing the Lord promises you today is peace. 
There is a peace coming upon you to decide where to go and what to do. He's not through with you. And uh, you've had study and you've had experience. You've even had what I'm looking at is like certifications. But there is something else the Lord wants you to journey in. Another road and another path. And he's focusing you beyond people's expectation or definitions of you. Okay, And um, very specifically... It feels like you've lost the love of your life. And the Lord says, let it go permanently forever. Okay? Because the unbraiding that's happened in your heart, it wasn't coincidental or circumstantial. It's the Lord. And you've been afraid to fully give up. But give up, baby. If you give up, what the Lord is going to do is open up doors beyond your wildest dreams. Right before the pandemic, you had international plans to travel uh, Europe and, and uh, different places uh, that you were going to go to learn certain things, opportunities there. And the Lord wants you to know he's not changed his mind about those plans or those opportunities. He's postponed them because he wants your soul ready for the skill depth that's within you. And in two years, you're going to be teaching what you learned. So he does not want you comfortable in, in, in the technical uh, areas of what you're doing now because you're going to teach and you're going to teach high schoolers and you're going to teach college age people and you're going to be moving in a level of uh, discipleship for people who do what you do. So brace yourself for the journey, yea, even the roller coaster of God, for that's what he's taking you on. But don't fear it. It's going to feel like whiplash and it's going to feel like struggle but it's going to be the Lord Father thank you for adventure and thank you for journeying thank you for trust in and over and around our life in the glorious name of Jesus come on put those hands together for the Lord all over this room come here you I'm done I think I will not have it be said, saith the Lord God, that one of mine is done unjustly. I see two things. One of them that I see is a bank. I see you behind like a teller glass. And I see conversations being held in an office about promotions uh, and about opportunities that you absolutely qualify for that's being delved out to another. And what the Spirit of God is going to do for you is make sure that He settles the conversation. And He's going to give you that promotion that you absolutely are worthy of and deserving of. One of them has been arguing, saying she's not been here long enough. She doesn't know enough. She hasn't been there. But favor is getting ready to come. That's going to blow you from counting money to creating policy. And there will be a team of eight people that follows you. And you're going to end up in a situation over the next several years where you'll be leading and directing and managing, but also training and also traveling. The final thing that I heard from the Lord is this. This is a sensitive area to your heart. But he told me to tell you he's going to be your baby daddy. I heard the voice of the Lord say, I'll be your baby daddy. I see a cabinet opened in your house. And the Lord says to tell you, it will not go empty again. He's going to fill it. And he's going to fill it with plenty. Plentiful. Your cupboards, your steps will be wa washed with butter. Your cupboards will be full. Uh-huh. Um and the things that you're still learning and still learning and still learning it won't devastate you or your baby what's going to happen is the Lord's going to stand over you like a rear guard he's going to stand with you and over you and uphold you and protect you um, and whatever this deadline is that's June the Lord says I'm the God of the deadline and you will find that my hand is in your midst like a mighty flame of fire come on put those hands together for the Lord all over this building um,
I don't know this. Um, something, um, this is weird. I'm going to just say what I see. Um, I, I, I keep seeing you with like military stripes, like rank on your shoulders. Um, and I feel like this has like natural significance, but I feel like in the spirit, it's about to have more significance, okay? You've gone through two years of excruciating pruning. It's, it's more than what a lot of people know, down from relationships to uh, who likes you, down to who doesn't, down to the vacillation of whether or not, I don't know what this means, you should go home or stay, or go home and stay. And I see, um, uh, a, a let me be very specific a, a, uh, a south shore plot around your life but around your ministry as well and an audience of people that anticipate your demise and, and literally anticipate your return to an old you a you that many of the people around here don't even know but in the, the Lord says the same way he was with you in the military, the same way he kept your mind, the same way he kept your body and preserved you from injury, he's going to preserve you now. And there are things that you are afraid of that you don't have to be afraid of anymore. There, there is an army of angels, they are very many, that stand over you night and day and night and day to make sure that the plot of the enemy concerning you does not work. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but, you know, the prophet's eyes spoiled a surprise. Uh, you're mulatto, like, so there's some white people in your blood, probably about, uh, I think, four generations back. I think there's a German guy. And what the Lord wants you to know is there was a heritage that's all the way up there that's about to find its way to you in one year's time. It's not going to be that you continue to work and hustle and grind only to provide for yourself. But in the same exact way you obeyed the Lord to come here and left what you did and who you did to come here, there is another leaving. And, uh, but this leaving is emotional and this, when this leaving happens in you, he's going to reward you where well, you won't be in a high rise. Praise the name of our God. And you won't be in a multi-unit. He's going to start to set your life up. And though you joke with your friends and you joke with your associates about being too old, the Lord says he's starting over in your life in a beautiful way. And uh, he's starting over in your life because he's got work for you to do. And yes, you want to know what it is, but he's not sharing it. He's not telling you because there are levels of obedience he wants to groom and grow in you for the next place. When you're done with this, there's going to be such an authority over the spirit of addiction that you flow in. I see a, a calling on your life. A, like, a, and it's, it's, it's not just alcoholism and it's not just like, I'm not talking about basic stuff. There's a spirit of, there's an authority coming on you. If I be God's man, to break the power of addiction in a certain way that is going to literally save lives. You will be a living and walking epistle. Easter, or the Easter week of 2015, there was a death appointment. The enemy had actually signed contracts to run you out of your mind. And there are things that you saw and, and people that you saw and you escaped by the angel of the Lord. That same escape is going to flow through you to other people. Do not regret, yeah, what you feel like is a loss of military benefit. <laughs> GI Bill. Veteran privilege. Don't cry over that. God's going to give you a brand new beginning. And it will be beautiful in a way you've never dreamed. Put those hands together for Jesus, will you? I'm so Ain't nobody coming to church next week.
uh, August, you're going to have the opportunity to travel, to do some training that's going to be absolutely essential for your career, okay? Now, I don't know what's going on in your, on your life. Lift your hands, but the Lord wants me to tell you to grow up. You've got to grow up. Um, you've been moving in some aggressive steps, but it's not strong enough. The Lord's preparing you for marriage, and um, you've got to grow up. You're behind in your behavior with your money, uh, in your behavior with your weeks, and how you live. He wants to mature you. And he's going to mature you because there's a type of rank. Uh, I keep seeing you, um, I keep having open visions of you moving fast up a ladder, climbing very fast up a lot ladder, but then also jumping high out of windows. And God has something for you in the realm of the fire department um, that, that, that's going to be more than what you think. You, you've had really um, um, downtime lately. But I also want to expose some people in all nations that have tried to prophesy wives on you. None of them are it. You don't know her yet. But God's ready. Uh oh. But um, God's readying you. He's got something for you to do. This is your career, and you should not regret going in just because it's slow. You're going to excel very fast in the Chicago Fire Department. And, um, and then after that, there's, there's, going to be, um, there's going to be managerial opportunity to do the other things that you want. Now, the reason the Lord wants you to grow up is because you've not started to work on property one, and there's about four more you should have. In the realm and uh, area of real estate, God's got a lot for you because you want to invest um, and you want to sow, but you've been slothful. And today, the Spirit of God is trying to groom you up into the full stature of who you should be. I'm not going to begin to share with you what I see for you for ministry because you're not even ready. There's a massive deliverance calling upon your life, but you've got to throw yourself fully, fully into a season of maturity. And you will be mocked for it. And uh, it will mean that you have to cut some people off because of it. Lord have mercy. But the Lord is trying to separate you to mature you in this specific way. That's the word of the Lord concerning you. Uh, 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 green shirt, yeah. The Holy Spirit says to tell you, make up your mind. He's delivering you from strong indecision. If God be God, follow him. I see one crowd calling you and another crowd calling you. And there's a crowd over here that are clout chasers. Okay. They, they, they sense what the Lord is trying to do and how he's trying to move you. So like a leech, they're trying to get a hold to your seek. But there's another sign that's trying to convince you that you are not who you are and what you do. Uh, do not grieve the days where you did praise and worship and don't grieve the days when you sang before the Lord in humility. They are coming back. But, but God's gonna surround you with such a support system that you're not going to go back and forth and back and forth. I'll leave it alone. I see a controlling woman in ministry who has a desire for who you're to be and what you're to become. She thinks she's an apostle and she's not. And what the Lord wants you to know is he's going to break the hand of deceptive teachers and he's going to cause you to excel in a brand new environment and you're going to begin to move paste and paste and paste. And I indeed see you in a classroom. And uh, God's going to move you in, in public and professional academia. And you're going to excel as a male teacher. But it's not going to be in your state. It will be in this one. And God's going to move you fast. And the Lord would say, look to the charter. 
because what I'm going to do for you is going to be unusual and abnormal. And I will make full use of everything you studied, even those credit hours that they told you didn't matter for the class you took. It's going to translate and transfer. And you're going to find that the word of the Lord is strong and sure concerning you. Put those hands together for the Lord, will you? Um, I've been prophesying for an hour. Stop me, please. Elder Radiant, stand up, baby. I promise you I'm done. Um, the seed of the Lamos. La the seed of the righteous. The seed of the righteous. You, you've, you've, you've been like a woman that's been crying in agony concerning the belief system of your baby. And the Lord wants you to know, I'll not have it be said that you serve my house and I leave yours. <laughs> The anger, the recent frustration, it has nothing to do with you or your husband. And everything to do with the story that she's not told you. And, the, and you've been sensing it in prayer, but you know that the conversation has I've been had. Brace yourself. There's some news coming, but you're equipped to handle the healing that needs to be done. And God's going to use you. And, and, and the Lord says, tell her, pretend like she's at the altar. When your baby comes to you, it's not just time to be mommy, it's time to be handmaiden. And you're going to labor through a process of pain. It will be hurtful, but it will not be your fault. It, it will not be your fault. She experienced some things in school. If I be God's man, before pandemic, she experienced some stuff that you don't know about. Some stuff of a racial nature, and also some stuff of a relational nature. And the weeks are going to go, and she's going to confess to you. And she don't think you're going to judge her. She just thinks you don't understand her. But the Spirit of God is going to create room. Why am I being taken into a ministry room in your house? I'm looking literally into an extra bedroom in your home that you've dedicated for prayer. And you've dedicated for ministry. You've dedicated it. What is this? I don't know what this is, but you've dedicated it to the uterus. And, and, and what the Lord wants you to know, this is, this is your destiny. You've not misheard, you've not misstepped. He's going to do some miracles in that room. And it will not, the, the only mistake you've made is that you thought it was natural wombs alone. But it will be spiritual wombs as well. Do it for your maid servant. In the name of Jesus. Your father is getting ready to come home. Something's happening in 2021 where there will be an early release from this prison sentence. Before your natural seed is walking the earth, your father will be a free man. And it will be almost an impossible circumstance, but the Lord is going to do it. People your entire life have judged your exterior, but your heart before the Lord has been weighed in the balance in heaven. You're moving into a season. I prophesy there's an eight-month season. Ask what you will. <laughs> Woo! The Lord says, ask what you will, and it will be done for you. He's not forgotten your years of prayer and your years of fasting, your years of meditation, your years of consecration. He also wants me to tell you he's not forgotten your years of discretion. I'm sorry, y'all. But the Lord wants you to, he says, ask what you will. And the favor of God is going to move in your direction. And the day will come, said the Lord, where before your father takes his last breath, he will confess Jesus is the God of heaven. Your God will be your father's God. I said your God will be your father's God and it will be said that the seed of the righteous has turned the stem toward him. Come on, put those hands together for the Lord, will you?
I'm sorry y'all all over this building come and glorify him glorify him <laughs> come on glorify him he's a worthy God he's a worthy God he's a worthy God my uh, sincere apologies I didn't mean to go this long uh, but this is the season that we're in God does want to talk to his people lift your hands I'm done uh, in the name of Jesus and what and, and prophet Aaron whatever the enemy is lying to you about with regard to infirmity the Lord wants you to know it's a blatant lie there is no premature death for you there, there is no there is no such thing as you not living out your purpose and your call the extension of days is the heritage of the saint of God that is the word of the Lord concerning you lift your hands in the name of Jesus of Nazareth I thank you Lord for this season this moment I thank you for this season, this moment that you've ordained for your people, my God. I thank you that it is not by accident, it's not by mistake, it's not by coincidence, but you've ordained a season for your people. And it's not just a season of recovery, it's a season of recompense, and it's a season of restoration, but also a season of revival. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, for those that are in this room uh, yes and for those that are watching me I declare the heavens open over them uh, in an unusual way in a bizarre way uh, in a strange way uh, let dew from heaven fall on these uh, in the name of Jesus uh, we bind rebuke uh, we arrest uh, the impact uh, the counseling uh, the effects uh, the trauma of the last season uh, over these every couple every husband every wife every business owner every ministry gift all those that experienced an unfair fight hey all those that experience an unfair journey with pain drama grief and agony all of that that happened in the inner man I pray right now in the strong name of Jesus who is the spirit of prophecy I pray right now that you would enamorate them fill them clothe them with a taste for the future an appetite for the days to come sight for what you've got planned strength to fight strength to bind strength to lose strength to declare strength uh, to decree uh, strength to see uh, strength to say uh, what's coming in the future in the name of Jesus uh, the adversary has been working uh, to take our eyes off of what's before us uh, and to put our eyes on what's behind us uh, but we declare right now uh, in this room uh, from this room to the world uh, forget the form Woo! Forget the former. Forget the former. I felt something break right there. Forget the former. Neither remember the days of old. For behold, oh Lord Jesus today. Good oh Lord the old. I said for behold. Woo -hee! Forget the former. Forget the former. I said forget the former. Neither remember the days of old. For behold, I do a new thing. And now it springs forth. And now it springs forth. Lord, we receive the new. We speak the new. We promise. Oh, we prophesy the new. We pray the new. Fasting for the new. Believing for the new. Praising for the new. I'm about to get caught up. We say the new. We see the new. We speak. Ooh, I'm about to lose it. We speak the new. We release the new. We fight with the new. We fight with the new. 
It doesn't mean that the old didn't happen. We're just warring with the new. Calling those things that be not as though they were. The end from the beginning. The end from the beginning. Give me a minute online. I'm sorry. I said the end from the beginning. All nations, the Holy Ghost has called you into something new. Whether you like it or not. The new. It happened. It happened. And it feel like it keep on happening. But the new. It's the new. It's the new I said. Lord have mercy. It's the new. The new of God. The new feeling. The new anointing. The new revelation. The new confession. The new career. The new house. The new relationship. The new exposure. The new authority. The new life. The new season. Lord have mercy. Can I get caught up for a minute? I feel the new. I was trying to leave. I feel the new. Wow! I feel the new, Jimmy. Woo! Hey, I was hurt by the old. Wounded by the old. Running from the old. Something happened on 7359. At 112 in the PM. Where the new came upon you. Lift your hands for the new. Come on. Glory. I'm about to get caught up. I said the new, the new. The new, the new. The new. Woohoo! The new. The new. It feels weird. Looks different. But I tell you, it's brand new. Come on, get ready for the new. Get ready for the, ow! I don't know what this is. The new is coming upon you. The new, don't explain it. Don't run from it. Don't hide it. Trap yield. The new, the new, the new, the new, the new, the new. Lord have mercy. Pastor Dow Cordes won't lift off me. Give me 20 seconds of a Shabbat all over this house. Come on, I'm trying to get it to live. Hey, come on. Pastor Pam, it's not lifting. Praise him for new stuff. I know you didn't expect it, so what? Hey, 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 oh, oh. The new. I, I said Shabbat. Sarah, I promise it's going to be new, baby. Come on, the new, the new. You ain't shouting, the new. Shut up, devil. Out with the old. Out with the old. Out with the old. Out with the old. In with the new. The new, the new, the new. Come on, praise him. I know we've been in here since 10, but I feel something stirring in my belly. It's been a long time since I had something new. Woo! I said it's been a long time since I had something new. It's been a while since I saw something new. I said it's been a while since I saw something new. But today in the temple, today in the glory, today while the heavens were open, I felt something brand Shut up, devil. We don't want the old. Tell Pharaoh he can have his onions. He can have his leeks. He can have his fig trees. I'm moving into milk and honey. God's got something new. I don't know how to describe it, what it looks like, but I know it's brand new. And if any man, they won't, Lord.
and if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And behold all things, Lord. Behold all things. Brand new. I said brand new. Hey, y'all can take us off. I'm, I'm about because I'm about to go up. I'm telling you right now. I said brand new. I said brand new, brand new, brand new, brand new. Take me off the air, brand new, brand new, brand new money, brand new ideas, brand new relationships, brand new bravery, brand new courage, brand new language, brand new emotions, 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 brand new meditation. Meditations, uh, brand new prayers, uh, brand new songs, uh, brand new revelations, uh, brand new insights, uh, brand new books, uh, brand new companies, uh, brand new properties, uh, brand new friends, uh, brand new associations, uh, brand new partnerships, uh, brand new approvals. Brand new approvals, 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 brand new gifts, brand new callings, brand new assignments, brand new assignments, brand new mandates, brand new dictates, brand new instructions. I said brand new. Lift your hand and say, yeah. Hey, don't leave me out here by myself. Praise him. Hey. Brand new heart. Glory. Wow. I said a brand new heart. Come on, praise him. A brand new heart. Come on, praise him. A brand new heart. A brand new heart. A brand new cry. A brand new sound. A brand new look. A brand new zeal. A brand new soul. Stirring a brand new lifting. Say it! Yeah! He died at a Kohoria and the Lamasa. Come on, go ahead. Don't hold back. I know you're going to have to get used to it. But receive the new of God. 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 Glory to God. I could use something new. What? Wow! I could use something new. Hallelujah! I could use something new. Call me to come. Hey, 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 hey! Woo! Woo! All nations, take your liberty. This ain't a show no more. We didn't left the production. And we didn't step into something brand new. I dare you. Whatever the new you've been looking for. Whatever the new you've been waiting for. Whatever the new you've been believing for. The new has just come on you. Hi, holy, come on, shout. I said the new has just come on you. Woo. You acting different. No, I'm just new. <laughs> Woohoo! New! That's what I am. I'm brand new. He changed me. Go away, go away, go away, go away, go away, go away. Come on, praise him. There you go, Bob. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Come on, praise him. Come on, praise him. Praise him. 
Hey, let's do this to show the world this is how you come out of a pandemic. How? We praise Him. Glory to God. Brand new. I said brand new. I said brand new. I said brand new. Believe it by faith. I said brand new. Brand new. Get ready for the cycle to be broken. God is releasing. God is blowing something brand new. Oh, 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 oh. I feel the glory of God. Lord have mercy. We sorry in a land. land. Our nations miss each other. And we've come together in this environment. And the Lord's got ready to pour out something brand new. May it come in your living rooms. May it come in your offices. May it come in your cars. May it come in your workspaces. Something brand new. 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 Woohoo! Ho! Something brand new. Yeah! 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 Yes! Yes! Come on, Linda! Yes! Yes! Something brand new. Something brand new. Hi! Something brand new. Something brand new. Lord have mercy. Wow! Something brand new is happening for you. Glory to God. Hi! Woo! I dare somebody just take out running real quick for something new. Come on, I just dare you. Run around this building for the new. Come on. There you go, Travi. It's happening. Hit it hard. Something brand new. They don't believe me. I'm not no lying prophet. There you go, mommy. It's going to be new. It's gonna be new, Elder Sean. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. It's gonna be new. There you go, Nia. New. Come on. There, oh. Come on. There you go. Praise it. I love that. There you go. Where my church at? We ain't got no visitors. Go ahead. Praise it, Ma. I love that right there. I love that. Come on, praise it. Oh, I love that. Come on. Praise it, Pastor Josh. Go ahead, son. Praise it. Come on, praise it. Hey, y'all been cute. I want you to take like 30 seconds real quick. Give God the glory. Come on, praise Him. It's been a while. There you go, Jordan. Praise Him, sugar. We don't need a reason. We got a right. Come on, everybody. Come on, hit the floor. I need a little bit more. Good evening, Facebook. Good evening, Instagram. We're going to praise Him for a minute. Cause we think something brand new is about to happen. There you go, son. Vance Kinzer, that's how you do it. Praise him, John John. Go ahead. There you go, Lillian. Praise him. Come on. Go real harder. Praise him, Robbie. It's time for a new year. I love that. Praise him. Go ahead, prophetess.
Give it to him, Ross. Praise him, Jimmy. I said, praise him, Jimmy. Weeping may endure for a night. Joy is coming right up in the morning. ignorant all over this place come on y'all a little while longer I feel some breakthrough I feel like if we praise him God's gonna give us some new property praise him right here Be oh! come on shout I don't know what I'm talking about I see some property coming I need all nations to praise him Come on, praise him. He keeps showing me title deeds. All nations, do you believe me? 30 days. 30 days. You'll have a new building. Jesus, I said 30 days, write it down, CFO, CO, all y'all, we're getting some new property, God got something more for us to do, perfect. Oh, I love that, come on. Go ahead a little hot. Come on, right now. If it's on the house, I said if it's on the house, if it's on the house, it's on your house. Woo Something new. I'm almost done. Apostle DJ, praise your way out of that mortgage. Do it now. You're about to be a landlord soon because of your faithfulness. I see a multi-unit is coming, right? Lord have mercy. Look to Blue Island. Good God. Oh. Y'all won't shout. A little harder, I'm done. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus,
Cheers, 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 cheers. Watch me. Open your mouth and say yes, Lord. Open your mouth and say yes. If you need more deliverance, say yes, Lord. If you need more healing, say yes, Lord. If you want something new, say yes. If you want something new, say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, your will. Yes, your way. Yes, I'll serve you every day. You say jump, how high? If you say go right now, yes, I'll serve you in the morning, in the noonday, in the evening, midnight hour. Yes, in my mind. 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 Yes, in my body. Yes, in my body. Yes, in my body. Yes, in my body. Yes, Lord. Every day, in any way, I'll obey. Every day, in any way, I'll obey. So say it. So say it. You'll say yes. So say yes. Yes, yes, so say yes. yes still yes. Yes, yes, still yes. Yes, still yes. yes, still yes. yes, yes still yes. yes, still yes. yes still yes. yes still yes. Yes, still yes. Yes, yes, I'll serve you. 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 I'll obey you. I'll obey you. I'll obey you. I'll obey you. Anyway. Every day I'll obey Come what may 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 open your mouth and see yes Lord 